Hello everyone, Jonah Mathis here. I have an absolutely incredible video for you today. We're looking at five of the most popular and high-end Dolby Atmos soundbar systems out there. This includes the Sonos Arc soundbar with two 1SLs and a Gen 3 sub, all sold separately, the Samsung HWQ950A, which I kind of claimed to be the king of soundbars a few months ago, the Bose Smart Soundbar 900 with the Bass Module 700 and the Surround Speaker 700, again sold separately, the Sony HT-A7000, SW5 subwoofer, and RS3S surround speakers, all sold separately. And lastly, the Klipsch Cinema 1200. I personally purchased all these systems except for the Samsung HWQ950A and the Sony HT-A7000 system. Samsung and Sony were nice enough to send these to me for testing purposes. I will be returning them after this video is published. I just wanted to be very upfront with you guys about this. In this video, I'm gonna cover many different categories about each system, including design, setup and connections, remote control and app support, audio codec support, music sound quality, surround sound quality, and my overall thoughts about each system. I'm going to do my best to rank them in order based on my preferences at the end of the video. I've put so much time and money into this video, it's hard to even quantify. So I would really, really appreciate it if you guys could destroy the like button on this video. It would help me out so much. Now with all of that said, let's get into this. So when I say the Sonos Arc system, I'm referring to the Sonos Arc soundbar, the Gen 3 Sonos Sub, and two Sonos One SLs used as surrounds. All of these pieces can be purchased as a set or individually, so you're able to upgrade over time. It's no surprise that this system is one of my favorites when it comes to its design. The Sonos Arc and One SLs have one of the best quality looks with their elegant curved mesh grills. The Sonos Sub complements this system with an extremely unique O-shaped design with two force canceling subwoofers built into it. The only thing I'm not particularly fond of is the full glossy finish covering the entire enclosure. It's an absolute fingerprint magnet. Altogether, this is a 5.1.2 channel system that has no problem standing out. The Samsung HWQ950A system is large to say the least. It comes with a huge soundbar, a subwoofer, and two wireless surround speakers. Each component of this system has cloth involved. The soundbar is almost entirely covered in cloth and the surround speakers have a cloth covering on the front, top, and on one side. I did notice some bubbling on the soundbar's cloth, which is slightly annoying, but certainly not a deal breaker. The subwoofer has a cloth cover for the driver on the right side and has a port located on the back. It definitely looks and feels the cheapest out of all of these subwoofers. I've never been a fan of cloth on soundbars because my cats like to destroy it, but that's just my opinion. However, it will definitely attract dust and debris, so it will take a bit of upkeep to maintain this system. This system supports up to 11.1.4 channels of audio, which is absolutely insane and is the most out of any system in this roundup by a lot. The Bose Smart Soundbar 900 system, which also comes with the Bose Bass Module 700 and the Bose Surround Speaker 700, has got to be one of the most practical of its time as far as looks and durability goes. The Bose Smart Soundbar 900 is wrapped around the front and sides with a dark black grill and topped off with a sleek tempered glass top. Its design was made for practicality, and I especially like the fact that there's absolutely no cloth on this system. The Bass Module 700 shares a very similar design with that same tempered glass on top and a simple yet elegant siding that looks very clean. It uses a 10 inch upward firing woofer, which is very unique for a subwoofer. As far as the Bose Surround Speaker 700, I was really surprised when I unboxed them. To say they were small is an understatement. They each stand less than six inches tall and two inches wide, but weigh just under one pound each. I was expecting them to be a lot larger from the pictures, but lesson learned, I should have looked at the dimensions earlier. Anyways, they have a brushed stainless steel design with perforations on each side for audio to travel through. Bose did an excellent job creating and designing a system that both looks great and feels like it will last a very long time. But I think the surround speakers need a serious upgrade. They come with these large power bricks and the way that you connect the speakers to power is just strange. In total, this system supports 5.1.2 channels of audio. The Sony HT-A7000 system consists of the soundbar itself, the Sony SW5 subwoofer, and the Sony RS3S surround speakers. Again, these components can also be purchased separately, so you can slowly upgrade the soundbar with additional components over time. 
The soundbar has a front metal grille and a large glassy section on top and cloth covering the two upward firing speakers and on its sides. There's a small port on each side that helps the sound expand outwards and makes it feel like it has a wider soundstage. The SW5 subwoofer has a 7 inch front firing woofer and larger down firing passive radiator. The front and back are both covered in a nicer cloth material and the sides and top are covered with this interesting textured leather looking material. I really like it. The RS3S surround speakers have a front metal grille and a decent plastic material covering all sides. So as far as channel support goes, this one is slightly confusing. The Sony HT-A7000 soundbar by itself supports 7.1.2 channels of audio. The point one is there because it apparently has two built-in subwoofers that are merged together into a single channel, but once you add the surrounds and sub to it, I don't know if it goes up to 9.2.2 channels of audio or 9.1.2 channels of audio and repurposes the built-in subwoofers. I'll add any updates in the description if I find out. The Clip Cinema 1200 system includes a massive 54-inch long soundbar, a giant subwoofer, and two wireless surround speakers. The soundbar has an all-wooden design, which is definitely sturdy and of great quality. It does unfortunately have cloth on the top and back, which will of course attract dust, debris, and cats, if you have any. The subwoofer is a beast of its own, with an all-wood finish and contains a downward firing 12 inch driver it is the largest and most definitely the heaviest on this list. The two surround speakers with this system are also fully made out of wood and fully covered in cloth. They have both a front firing and upward firing driver in them. And lastly, this system supports up to 5.1.4 channels of audio. Okay, now for their displays. So the Sonos Arc and Bose Soundbar 900 don't actually have displays. Both only have an LED indicator that will light up when they receive certain commands. Volume up, volume down, mute, etc. I guess it helps keep a clean design, but not super practical. Fortunately, all of their settings are contained within their mobile apps, but we'll get into that a little bit later. The Samsung, Sony, and Klipsch soundbars all have a display of some sort. For some reason, Samsung decided to put the display on top of the soundbar. Very, very annoying. Some people have even resorted to using a prism to be able to use it while sitting down. Otherwise, it's kind of useless. However, it does have three LEDs on the front that will indicate various commands. Again, like volume up, volume down, you get it. The Klipsch soundbar has a monstrous display that makes it easier to adjust any and all of its settings. The Sony has a much smaller display that's kind of hard to see, but it still works perfectly fine. However, the Sony A7000 is extremely unique for a soundbar. It has a completely built-in user interface. When you press the home button on the remote control, it will bring up its UI that resembles that of an audio video receiver. This is something I haven't seen done with any other soundbar system out there. Very cool, Sony. Now for all the connections on each system. I'll try to break this down as simply as I can. So for HDMI ARC support, I'm pleased to say that every single one of these systems supports HDMI EARC, or Enhanced Audio Return Channel, in short, EARC. I know it's not exactly correct, but it's much easier to say over and over again. EARC is also backwards compatible and works with standard ARC, but you'll be limited to the Dolby Digital Plus audio codec, which means you'll only get a compressed Dolby Atmos signal from your TV. But TVs that support HDMI EARC can pass through audio codecs like Dolby True HD and DTSX, which are both uncompressed 3D object-based audio formats. That's kind of why many people are interested in these soundbars. I'll talk a bit more about audio codecs later on. The Sonos Arc and Bose Soundbar 900 don't have any HDMI inputs, just an HDMI eARC port. The Samsung, Sony, and Klipsch soundbars all have two HDMI inputs, although the Samsung Q950A and the Klipsch Cinema 1200 only support HDMI 2.0B, which means they can only pass through 4K at 60Hz and 8K at 30Hz. Not exactly future-proof, but that doesn't affect many people. But finally, the Sony A7000 is the first soundbar ever to support HDMI 2.1. This means that it can pass through video signals up to 4K 120Hz and 8K 60Hz. This isn't exactly a huge deal because any TV that supports 4K 120Hz is going to have plenty of HDMI 2.1 inputs on it. But it's still really cool to see a soundbar that finally supports it. Then for the other connections. Most of these really aren't that important, so I'm only going to highlight some of them. All of these systems have a digital optical input, and the Sonos Arc comes with an HDMI to digital optical adapter, 
but you should avoid using digital optical because it limits the system to 5.1 channels of compressed audio. Therefore, with digital optical, you will not get Dolby Atmos audio. The Bose soundbar has an adaptive port where you can connect an included microphone to calibrate the system. It also has a base port where you can connect a 3.5 millimeter auxiliary cable to provide a wired connection to the base module 700. The Sony soundbar has an S center out port where you can connect a compatible Sony TV that allows it to help with playing the center channel of audio. I don't have a Sony TV, so I wasn't able to test this, unfortunately. And lastly, the Clips soundbar has a sub-out RCA port, so you can connect any active subwoofer to the system in addition to the included subwoofer. Very happy to see this. All these systems support AirPlay 2 and Chromecast audio streaming, with the Sonos Arc being the only system that doesn't offer Bluetooth connectivity. I don't think Bluetooth is a huge deal because both AirPlay and Chromecast allow it so you can easily stream audio from basically any device at this point. But I do understand the need for some people. The setup process for all these systems is very, very similar. So instead of going over the steps individually for each and every system, I'll explain how their setup processes differ from each other and describe my experiences with them. All of the components in each system wirelessly link together in some way, whether they're piggybacking off of your current Wi-Fi network or using their own dedicated wireless network separate from your existing Wi-Fi network. So all you have to do is connect power to all of the components, soundbar, subwoofer, and surround speakers. Then connect an HDMI cable to the soundbar's HDMI ARC port and connect the other end to the TV's HDMI ARC port. If your TV doesn't have an HDMI ARC port, it might be time to upgrade your TV before purchasing a high-end soundbar system. But if you don't wanna do that, then you may need to go with one of these systems that has HDMI inputs. You can basically bypass HDMI ARC and connect your media devices directly to the soundbar and output the video signal to your TV. The Sonos system uses your existing Wi-Fi network to transmit data between all of the components. You can connect the Sonos Arc soundbar to your network with an ethernet cable. Then you can set it to create and use its own private wireless network that's only used for different Sonos components. You'll need to use the Sonos S2 app to fully set up and use all of the features of this system. When adding the different components in the Sonos app, it's best to set up the Sonos Arc first, then add the subwoofer and two surround speakers. It's a very simple and easy easy to do process, but it does take some time to get them fully connected and working. The Samsung Q950A doesn't require Wi-Fi for all the components to actually work. The surround speakers and subwoofer will automatically link with the soundbar when they are powered on. You technically don't need Wi-Fi at all if you're simply playing things from your TV or another media device. But to use features like AirPlay and Chromecast, as well as receive firmware updates, you'll need to use the SmartThings app to connect the system to your Wi-Fi network. Definitely a quick and painless setup process. All of the components in the Bose system wirelessly link together without using your Wi-Fi network. However, you do have to connect the Bose Soundbar 900 to your Wi-Fi network first, then you can wirelessly pair the base module and the surround speakers to it. It does have a very similar setup process to the Sonos Arc. The Bose Music app and Sonos S2 app both look and feel very similar. While it has a fairly simple setup process, it does take a little while to set it up initially. Creating a Bose account, linking to Wi-Fi, waiting for the firmware to update, which took nearly 15 minutes for me, then you're ready to go. The Sony system is a bit different from the others because of its built-in UI. So in order to connect the SW5 subwoofer and RS3S surround speakers, you'll need to press the home button on the remote control and navigate to the settings menu. Then you can start the linking process. I'm not sure if this is supposed to happen automatically or not, but it didn't happen for me. Luckily, they did pair up almost instantly after starting the manual pairing process. They are not utilizing your Wi-Fi network to communicate with each other, so that is a plus. Next, you have to connect the soundbar to your Wi-Fi network via the Sony Music Center app. This app looks slightly outdated, but works perfectly fine. Kind of annoying that you're going to two different places in order to set up certain things, but it could be worse. Speaking of worse, let's talk about the Clips Cinema 1200 setup process now. I could probably rant about this for about five minutes, but I'll try to keep this concise. So back when I did my review video on this system, the mobile app was essentially useless. All it was used for was to connect the system to Wi-Fi so you could use AirPlay, Chromecast, and Amazon Alexa. The surround speakers and subwoofer automatically link to the soundbar and don't require a Wi-Fi connection in order to work properly. While it was extremely easy to set up, again, the app basically did nothing back when I reviewed it. However, they recently updated the app to fulfill some of the promises that were made a long time ago, which is awesome, right? Well, here's where things got very frustrating. So in order for these updates in the app to actually work, the soundbar's firmware needed to be updated. No big deal, right? 
Well, unlike every other soundbar, there's no way to push a firmware update inside of the app. It's supposed to update automatically at some point, but I have no idea if this actually does this or not because I didn't have time to wait for it. So I opted to push a firmware update manually through their instructions on the support page. Well, loading a flash drive with a specific file two times, many specific button combinations, lots of waiting, quite a few power cycles, and 45 minutes later, the soundbar was finally updated. Not a fun process at all. And I hope that anyone with the older firmware version doesn't have to go through this. But I really haven't seen anything in forms about the update, so I have no idea. All right, now let's talk about the remote controls, mobile apps, and exactly what you're able to do with each. I'm not gonna go through these individually because that would be super boring. Instead, here's a semi-easy table that lists out the different settings available and how they can be controlled. Here are the major things though. The Klipsch system doesn't have any form of audio calibration. Now, audio calibration is nice, but it's not the end-all be-all. Most barely modify the sound profile for the system, except for Sonus's TruePlay and Sony Sound Field optimization. Both of these made a pretty substantial difference. Then everything after that really isn't a huge deal except for maybe height, subwoofer, and surround channel adjustments. My big wish is that all these settings would just be integrated into their apps. Then you wouldn't need a remote control at all, but a man can only dream. For audio codec support, all these soundbars support Dolby True HD. Again, this includes uncompressed Dolby Atmos, hence the title of this video, Best Dolby Atmos Soundbars. But the Samsung and Sony soundbars are the only ones that currently support DTSX. This is usually only a big deal for those that use a Blu-ray player and have a sizable Blu-ray disc collection, but nonetheless, it's still a bummer. Sonos has promised to add support for DTS Digital Surround, which supports a lossy or compressed 5.1 channel signal. And lastly, all of these systems support up to 7.1 channels of LPCM audio, except for the Bose soundbar, which only supports up to 5.1 channels of LPCM audio. Now, I do want to mention this. If you're mainly using Netflix, Hulu, Disney+, and other major streaming services, they all output Dolby Atmos, which is carried through the Dolby Digital Plus audio codec. Dolby Digital Plus is one step below Dolby True HD, where True HD supports uncompressed Dolby Atmos and Dolby Digital Plus supports compressed Atmos. The only time you really get Dolby True HD audio is if you are one, playing a movie through a certain Blu-ray disc, or two, using a Plex media server loaded with movies that have Dolby True HD audio. I will likely make a full video on this because it can be a pretty confusing topic, but I hope this makes some sense. So subscribe and leave a comment if you're interested in a video on this topic. If you're interested in one of these systems and you wanna learn more about it, be sure to check out my individual review for that system after you finish watching this video. I go a bit more in depth on every aspect of them in my individual reviews. You can find links to those videos in the description below. Again, be sure to check it out after this video. Okay, it's time to talk about surround sound quality now. I tested various movies and TV shows on each of these systems, re-watching the same scenes over and over and over again with each setup to pick out the differences as best I could. Remember, we all interpret audio and sound differently, so keep that in mind when you hear what I have to say. Sonos has done an amazing job of creating a high quality experience with each step they take. The Sonos Arc System surround sound is a prime example of this. The 3D sound bubble is really good, and the whole system is very consistent in creating a desirable experience. There's a fairly wide sound stage that this soundbar delivers, and it's quite shocking. For the size of the Sonos Arc, it would be hard to ask for much more. The soundbar is crystal clear with all of the mid-range and higher frequencies, which makes for excellent dialogue intelligibility. In each scene I watched in Ford vs Ferrari, the dialogue was clear and crisp and it even sounded like you were listening to the conversation in person. To top it off, the Sonos Sub did a great job as always. Handling all the low-end frequencies is an underestimated task it achieved. There was no distortion and each impact I could hear and feel. It was fully immersive and you felt every bit of it. In an action scene in John Wick, you could feel every gunshot and punch thrown beat right out of your chest. 
along with the performance of the soundbar and the sub, each of the surround speakers does a great job of rounding out the system. Altogether, when working with one another, the surround sound is one of my favorites. The biggest downfall to the Sonos system is the surround speakers, the Sonos One SLs. Compared to other surround speakers, they feel very directional, where they don't really expand the sound out a lot, more so shooting in a straight line. I've talked about it before, and if Sonos added surround speakers that include upward firing drivers into their product line, then I could see the system moving further up everyone's list. As of now, this system may not be the best at creating clear overhead sound effects, but it's still noticeable that they're present. Despite its shortcomings, the Sonos Arc system delivers a great audio experience that many people have already come to love, including myself. The Samsung HWQ950A brought something new to the field that none of the others here have. The surround speakers not only have upward firing speakers, but also side firing speakers. Samsung totally crushed it with this change, having those two extra speakers firing off to the sides to create a fully immersive experience was amazing. For an open concept living room, creating an immersive 3D audio bubble is no easy task, but this system, it just nails it. While it may not have the same frequency range as the others, its overall quality certainly makes up for it. The low end impacts produced from the sub aren't that impressive, but it does a good job of following along with the scene and everything that's going on. Some of the other systems can get lost and don't always have a cohesive feel to them. There weren't many instances where the Samsung system was in over its head. The system knew its limits and stayed within them pretty well. The way the audio is projected from the soundbar makes it feel like it's so much wider than it actually is, much better than the Sonos Arc. The front soundstage just sounds absolutely massive. Along with this, the soundbar has no issues at all with dialogue and mid-range frequencies. There were some cases where the higher frequencies got to be a little too bright and were a little harsh on the ears. I noticed this in a couple of scenes in Ford vs Ferrari where the GT40 was sliding to a stop. The tires were screeching very, very loudly, and the soundbar just didn't handle it very well. But this was definitely a more rare occurrence. The only real pain point I have is its impact and overall consistency with the low end. With each part of the system working together, it easily created the most pleasing 3D multi-directional audio experience. While testing the Bose Smart Soundbar 900 was far from a wow factor in terms of expectation and reality, from the moment we hit play on Ford vs Ferrari, the high-pitched squeals from the car were just a bit too bright and pretty harsh on the ears as well. The surround speakers sound good, but they lack some of the power behind them that other systems have. I had to turn the surround speakers up to plus 40 just to get them to be a bit louder. Unfortunately, by doing so, the speakers kind of struggle to keep up. The real power behind the system comes from the soundbar. I never would have expected it to sound as big as it did. All of the mid-range frequencies were very clear, and even some of the lower frequencies were evident. It was really impressive, and even more so when accompanied by the subwoofer beside it. The subwoofer is simply fantastic. It does a great job of dispersing the low end throughout the entire room to ensure it actually surrounds you rather than slapping you. It's almost like you can't even tell where the bass is coming from most of the time, which is a great feeling. The balance between the sub and the soundbar is excellent. The downfall is completely and totally the surround speakers. They do a good job of producing the higher frequencies, but anything in the mid-range just feels like it's not there. They don't help balance the system out like every other surround speaker set does. And at $550, I feel slightly cheated. From the price, to the sound, to the size of them, I believe there's no way they can deliver what the rest of the system does. The Sony HT-A7000 sends shivers down your spine with how immersive the surround sound is. After watching Ford vs Ferrari, it literally gave me goosebumps numerous times. Every detail was spot on and it felt like you were on the track and a part of the experience. For the subwoofer to have a smaller front firing sub and down firing passive radiator, I never would have expected it to deliver the strong punches it does. It wasn't overbearing and its accurately delivered bass took action scenes to the next level. I found that the most enjoyable mode was the cinema sound mode. After listening to the sound system, I found that watching any movie that has properly mixed audio is extremely impressive, to say the least. The soundbar also did incredibly for there not to be upward firing surround speakers. The soundbar did a lot of work to cover lost ground here. With that being said, all audio transitions were very smooth and left no gaps in the 3D bubble to get lost. The upward sound effects were not as noticeable though and the clips comes out a little more well-rounded with the overhead sound. The performance of this system was shocking altogether. I expected high quality sound and in my opinion, Sony delivered something better. I feel like the next step for 
Sony is to create some wireless surround speakers that have upward firing drivers built in. Same exact things I've said about Sonos. I don't know if this will ever happen, but I certainly hope that it does. When it comes to the Clips Cinema 1200, the surround sound performance was just not as impressive after listening to the Sony, Samsung, and Sonos systems. Just about the best thing going for the Clips is the upward firing surround speakers that the competitors don't have. It creates a great overhead sound that is much more evident than others, but this system needs a whole lot more than that. With a subwoofer that seemed to hit big in some areas, but completely miss in others. Sitting in front of a TV and watching John Wick fight didn't feel nearly as exciting as it should have been. But then at other moments, the subwoofer felt like it was shaking the entire house. I don't know, it's very strange. The 3D audio bubble is pretty decent at times, but it kind of sounds like a complete area of audio is missing when it transitions from the front, to the back, and I'm pretty sure it's the soundbar's fault, not the surround speakers. There wasn't anything about the system that particularly stood out to me. Even without evaluating that $1,900 price tag, seeing how it performed doesn't make sense with the massive soundbar and subwoofer that it has. Like, it's the biggest soundbar in this list by a decent margin, but it definitely doesn't sound the biggest or provide more detail than others. The only thing that this soundbar does better than the others is the dialogue. It's very crisp and clear, but other than that, I think it could be so much better. When I finally got to testing music for each of these systems, there were some surprising changes from what I saw previously when testing movies. There are some that were completely different and some that managed to stay consistent, like the Sonos system for instance. I use Spotify for a majority of the music testing because I know it's one of the most popular music streaming platforms that basically everyone uses. And do take my opinions here with a grain of salt. These soundbar systems weren't really designed with music in mind, except for Sonos and Bose, but that's only because of their existing ecosystem. Systems. If music quality is something that is more important than surround sound quality to you, then a soundbar system may not be the best choice for you. Now, let's get into this. It was no surprise to me when the Sonos Arc system performed perfectly in the music testing, and I've gotta say, it's probably my favorite when it comes to music. I love the versatility to manage and set the surround speakers to ambient or full mode. This allows the surround speakers to either play in the background or play to their full potential with the rest of the system. Now, being able to adjust the volume levels depending on if you're watching TV or playing music is a small feature that does this system much justice. I'm not quite sure why nobody else has an option like this, but hopefully it's coming in the future. Even though I was impressed thus far, after I used TruePlay tuning, it made a massive difference in how the music sounded in the living room, very quickly and seamlessly compared to the other systems. The settings were fully customized for my living room. It was a night and day difference. With the Samsung HWQ950A, the system did a pretty good job. Compared to others, it definitely has room for improvement, but I'm impressed to say the least. For its price, the soundbar does a great job of producing the mid-range and higher frequencies. There was no distortion, tinniness, or anything like that, and the quality was definitely there. With playing music, this system seems to focus on the vocals a lot more, and the punches from the bass just weren't there nearly as much. I know it has the ability to do more, as I saw when testing movies, but I was slightly let down that I couldn't adjust the settings much to improve how music sounded. Of course, it's good to consider that Samsung did focus on its movie mode since not many are really going to be using a system like this primarily for music. But all in all, it was not that impressive while playing music. It took a lot of work to try and manipulate the settings to deliver anything close to the sound quality I heard in Ford vs Ferrari. When listening to music on the Bose Smart Soundbar 900 system, I did get a different result from the subwoofer, especially. With how small the surround speakers are, they actually did a good job considering how they performed so far. Yes, I expected more from Bose, but at least it's evident that they are on while listening to music. On the other hand, it sounds like the soundbar was the piece holding it all together. Most of the weight was being carried by the soundbar, and for the price, I expected a lot more from this system. Overall, the music testing did sound much more balanced and there weren't any harsh or tinny sounds that I heard in some prior instances. The Sony HT-A7000 was off to a rough start with the music testing. It wasn't amazing at first, but after a little adjusting, I got it to where it was very enjoyable to listen to. There are a few settings I wish they would add to make the whole process a lot easier. First, I'd like to see separate settings for music and TV. Once the settings are dialed in for music, they need to be changed back when I switch back to the TV. Second, there really needs to be a way to adjust each piece of the system in each mode. If you're in music mode, you can't do anything with the surround speakers. The only way I got them to play ambient music was in standard surround mode, otherwise they were basically off. After the settings were sorted out, I did get to the point where it worked well enough. I fully expected great things from Sony, especially from its performance with movies and TV, 
They didn't let me down, I just expected a little more here. The Clip Cinema 1200 did perform in a way that no other system was able to by filling the room with more audio than I would ever want. And I don't mean that in a good way. All the sound modes basically only adjusted the surround speakers and very slightly adjusted the sub. The bass is very clear and evident and the surrounds are fairly soft until you click party mode. This mode just turns the surround speakers all the way up till it's nearly unbearable. After sound testing many systems and seeing fairly consistent results, Clips destroyed the consistency. The music mode needs an overhauling to say the least. It seemed like the center channel of the soundbar was handling the majority of all the audio with music. The left and right channels didn't seem to be doing much for that fact. This may be because of the way the soundbar is processing the audio, but it wasn't flattering. Overall, the soundbar doesn't perform terribly with music, it's just not my favorite. If you were in a very large room and hosting a large event or party, this may be ideal, but it's just not for me. So now I'm going to rank these systems from one to five, with five being my least favorite and one being my most favorite. Now keep in mind, this is purely my personal preference, but I'm keeping all aspects in mind here, including most importantly, sound quality, then connections, setup, looks, design, and more. You don't have to agree with these rankings, that's fine. Again, these are just my opinions. We are all going to interpret audio and sound differently and have our own set of expectations. And just because I put a system in last place doesn't mean it is bad or terrible. It just means that I think one of the other systems is better. So starting off with just the sound bars by themselves, not taking into consideration the surround speakers or subwoofers, because you can purchase three of these sound bars by themselves without the subwoofers or surround speakers. This includes the Sony, Sonos, and Bose soundbars. So at number five is the Clip Cinema 1200 soundbar. Even though it's by far the largest on the list, I just don't think it's that great. For number four, it's the Bose Smart Soundbar 900. It is a beautiful design that I'm a big fan of, and the sound is not bad at all, especially for its compact size. And number three is the beloved Sonos Arc. Yes, surprise, surprise, I'm not a true Sonos fanboy, but it's still a great soundbar that I plan on keeping for a long time, and it does a fantastic job with all sorts of media. Then at number two is the Samsung Q950A soundbar. The multi-direction of the soundbar is just really, really good. And it gets ridiculously loud and doesn't distort the audio much, if not at all. You can get the Samsung Q900A, which is the same system without the surround speakers, for a bit cheaper too. And lastly, at number one, is the Sony HT-A7000 soundbar. I really enjoy every aspect of the soundbar. The large front soundstage, the 3D bubble, it's far superior low end compared to all the other soundbars by themselves, and more. It's an all around good standalone soundbar in my opinion. Okay, now for the overall rankings. This takes all of the components into consideration, including their ease of use, available software, features, controls, etc, etc. Again, I'll give the ranking, then exactly why it's ranked there. Starting with number five is the Bose Smart Soundbar 900, Bass Module 700, and Surround Speaker 700. I really wanted this system to beat out some of the others, but there are a few reasons that it's ranked so low. I love the design and sound quality of both the soundbar and subwoofer but the surround speakers are pitiful compared to every other set. Absolutely pitiful. They are small, don't output a ton of sound, I mean enough to be surprising for their size, but still not a lot, and they're the most expensive surround speakers at $550. And the large power brick, the way they connect is just not very flattering at all. Ridiculous. Bose definitely needs to up their game with their surround speakers and it could easily make its way up this list. But as of right now, that's where it is. Number four, the Clip Cinema 1200. I was sort of tossed up between whether this should be five or number four, but went with this because for $1,900, it's not a horrible system. Could you get something better sounding for cheaper? Most definitely. But it still provides a pretty good surround sound audio experience. I just wish the soundbar itself sounded a bit better and that I didn't have to go through the not so fun firmware update process. Number three is the Sonos Arc Gen 3 Sub and two Sonos One SLs. I've been a fan of this system for a long time. It's been what we use in our living room whenever I'm not testing a new soundbar out. I like it, Ashley likes it, our guests enjoy it, and it has a very clean and modern design. I wish the surround speakers had upward firing speakers on them and that Sonos's products weren't so expensive, but I can't really change these things. This system used to cost $1,856, now it's $2,086. Sonos recently increased their prices, which is a pretty big bummer, and they also rarely ever discount their products because they already struggle to keep up with their current demand. At that big of a price tag, it might be worth going with something else if you aren't already embedded into their ecosystem. And at number two is the Samsung HW Q950A. 
I'll start this off by saying that this system by far is the best for its price tag. Its retail price hovers around $1,600, but it very often goes on sale for about $1,300, which is an absolute steal in my opinion. The soundbar and surround speakers do such an amazing job of creating an extremely immersive and engaging home entertainment experience. The only things I don't love about the system is its horribly placed display on top of the soundbar, the cloth, mainly because of my cats, so I can't really count that one, and the subwoofer, but mainly the subwoofer. In my opinion, it's something about the design that just doesn't work. All these other subwoofers are either down firing or front firing, and I like them miles more than this one. I hope they revisit this design in their next system or allow customers to add an additional subwoofer to pump up the low end a bit. But other than those things, this system is really fantastic. And lastly, at number one, is the Sony HT-A7000 SW5 subwoofer and RS3S surround speakers. This system works very, very well together. The soundbar, while pretty expensive at $1,300 by itself, does a bit more than the others and just sounds really great in my opinion. The subwoofer is, I think, somewhat fairly priced at $700, and the surround speakers are actually the cheapest at only $350. Yes, it's an expensive system altogether. You're looking at about $2,350 for this entire system. It's expensive, don't get me wrong. But after watching many, many different movies with it, I'm just extremely impressed with its overall performance and output. I'm in love with the sound quality and 3D audio experience that it provides. It's just really, really good. I don't know how else I can express it. Could it be a little better? Yes, absolutely. Surround speakers could be upgraded. And they also offer the SW3 subwoofer, which is only $400. So this could potentially get the price down to about $2,050, which I don't think is a bad price for everything that you get here. Again, if you're interested in the individual reviews of each system, they will be linked in the description down below. Make sure you smash that like button to let YouTube know that the 100 plus hours put into making this video was well worth it. Follow me on Instagram at jonamathis underscore YT and sign up for my newsletter if you wanna get updates on what's going on in the audio world. Thank you all so, so much for watching and I will see you guys in the next one. Bye.